For the past three weeks, uh, we have been reflecting Paul's letter to the Colossians with the series title, Reshaping Our Lives Around Jesus. Reshaping Our Lives Around Jesus. And our hope through this series is to have an opportunity to look, in, look into our lives so that we can intentionally, creatively, and proactively design each of our days around Jesus. So that's our hope. The opening of the letter was full of gratitude, if you remember, towards uh, Colossian Christians for their faithful, fruit-bearing lifestyle through the gospel. Then we, we were reminded of what the, gospel, what the gospel was all about. Christ, who is the creator of all things. Christ, who is the head of the body, the church. Christ, through whom all things are reconciled through his blood shed on the cross. And the portion we read today uh, continues to talk about this Christ. But starting in chapter 2, we can see why, the reason Paul was writing this letter of encouragement to the Colossian Christians. Apparently there has been a lot of distractions for the early Christians. Because Christianity has not been fully established with guidelines yet, there have been other voices who claimed the truth. Some may have described themselves or their teachings as philosophy. Some may have described theirs as tradition. Some may have talked about elemental spiritual force, as described in verse 8. It talks about elemental spiritual forces. These were also called uh, by Paul principalities and authorities. And these voices believe that these combination of these philosophy or tradition, elemental spiritual forces and authorities, authorities constitute the fullness of divine powers. This is what was going on during the Colossian church time. And the important piece to this was that they judged their piety or a piety of a person by how you follow those religious laws. The questions about what you eat or drink, or are you circumcised or not, or your observance of a new moon celebration day or a Sabbath day was how you were judged if you were in line with their religious teachings. According to a commentator, James Price, uh, he said, Colossian Christians were being offered a religion of knowledge. Colossian Christians were offered a religion of knowledge, which enabled an individual to disarm the principalities and powers of the invisible wor world, and also to put off the old nature and attain fullness of life doesn't sound that off, right? But this is how Paul describes all of these ideas. In verse 19, he said, they have lost connection with the head. They have lost the connection with the head. And that word, connection, caught my attention. Whenever I get a chance, uh, whenever I have an opportunity. I enjoy walking the downtown of Montpelier. I like it because Montpelier downtown is pretty, pretty uh, contained within the two streets. So it's doable. But the best part of walking is that you realize how much you were missing out by driving your car around. I live about five minutes away uh, by car from church and maybe a slightly longer time downhill commute on a bicycle, maybe longer up, uphill. But um, you do sometimes see someone as you um, 
as you're driving by, walking on the, on the sidewalk or sitting at a bench or coming out of a store, you know, you see someone that you know. But if you're in your car, if you're in your car, you just miss the chance to connect with them. You see them, but you miss the chance, right? On a bike, you might have a slightly better chance, but it is still too quick of a commute. And I'm not suggesting that we all start to stop driving our cars, because that's not going to happen. And wander around downtown searching for random conversations. That's not the point. But I'm inviting you to think about the culture we live in, where our daily goals are about how to get to our next destination faster and more effectively. The culture where we gravitate towards those with better answers and quicker explanations about things. I was just wondering, because of such obsessions of this culture, aren't we missing out on other things that we can experience only when we walk? How about our spiritual life? Our spiritual life. We should ask ourselves, are we rushing to, uh, rushing to easy and quicker answers to our current spiritual situations, more comfortable and short-term practices that we can manage in our busy schedule? Isn't that what was happening to those in the Colossian church who call themselves as philosophers and traditionalists to be eventually obsessed with legalistic practices as their quick answer. If I borrow uh, a theologian named Frederick Beekner's words on his definition about the law of love, he said, a legalistic, legalistic religion like the Pharisees is in some ways very appealing. All you have to do in any kind of ethical dilemma is look it up in the book and act accordingly. Jesus, on the other hand, says all you have to do is love God and your neighbors. That may seem more appealing still until, in dilemma after dilemma, you try to figure out just how to go about doing it. In Beekner's expression, in dilemma after dilemma, in failure after failure, all you can do is to keep trying to love God and your neighbors not driving by, not flying over, but to walk next to. In fact, the word in verse 6 of what we read today, where it says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. It says that that word, to live, can be also translated as to walk. So it can be read, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk your life in Him. Pay attention to that pace. There was a book I read a few years back called Connected by Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler from Harvard University. And the point they were trying to make uh, is that, uh, pretty simple, we are all connected. And that is uh, that this connected social network of ours is a living thing. It constantly evolves, which, uh, which they call it as super organism. So this is what our uh, network is. And that we need more of these connections in today's world. In this book, they mention about the six degrees of separation, which says that everyone in this world is connected if, uh, if you go six degrees. So you will know everyone if you hop six times of your social, social connections. 
But uh, I think I, I mentioned that before, uh, like a few years back. But they also talk about the three degree of influence. Uh, three degree of influence rule, which is saying everything we do or say tends to ripple through our network, having an Im impact on our friends, and then our friends' friends, and even our friends' friends' friends. That's the three degree of influence rule. So, it, so for example, if there is an inventor, uh, so uh, this inventor's creativity influences her colleagues, her colleagues' colleagues, and her colleagues' colleagues' colleagues. And this influence can be anything from creativity, creative ideas, or a smile, a drinking habit, or a political view. What they are arguing is that if the sixth degree of separation, the first one, the sixth degree of separation tells us how connected we are, the observation that there are three degrees of influence tells us how contagious we are. Did you get that? So if we put this in the perspective of gospel and our lives as followers of Christ, what we do or say as God's children will ripple through our network. Having not just a direct impact in the immediate situations, but to the next degree and the one after that. And the best part of this connectional nature is that it begins with Christ. Right? Christ is the first influencer. So if you are one of those who are influenced by Christ's love, I hope you're all, it should ripple through us. We can say it is not us who is at the center of this love influences. But it is God who initiates. And I think Paul agrees with that in verse 13 through 15 from what we read today. It says, when you, are, when you were dead in your sins and in the un uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. God forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. God is the one who has taken, taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and the authorities. God made the public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That's verse 13 through 15. That's grace. That's grace. That's simply grace. So we're going to end our service today by singing a song called The Summons, uh, which is a pretty well-known song if you've been around the United Methodist Church, uh, um, along with Here I Am, Lord. Um, whenever we sing about being sent out or you know, living out our calling. This is one of the songs that we sing all the time. But when we sing this song once again today, I invite you to think about from whom the invitation is coming from. Before our own desire to live our lives certain ways, before our own desire to choose which law to live by, before our own wisdom to formulate our own reasonable responses, just take a moment and think about who's inviting us in the first place. Verse 1 goes like this. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name 
be known. Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? And we're going to skip over to verse 4, and it goes like this. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me? Will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around? The question is, will you? And that's the invitation. So as we ponder on that voice that calls us to be connected to our head, Jesus Christ, I pray that in each moment of your everyday walk, I pray to God that God will grant us the boldness and the courage to slow down, give up the car keys, and walk. Take some time to get to your destination. And that your everyday walk in this spiritual journey will be a witness to God's grace towards you and to all of the creation. Amen.